How many times have I done the show? Never with a scientist researcher who is working hard to find the cure and to take care of AOS. I have Hamali, and you better give me the last name. Patnani. Oh, who is with the New York Geno Center, who is also with Columbia University, who is a, an educator, a teacher, a scientist, and a wonderful lady. So tell me about your family. Let's go back to dad's side and then mom's side. My dad um, was born in what is now Pakistan. This is before India and Pakistan were split. They moved as refugees to India when my dad was six years old. So he came with his younger sister and his mom, and my grandfather followed later. On my mom's side, she's from a place in India called Gujarat, but she was born in Mumbai. And my dad and my mom... Mumbai is called Bombay, Bombay, right? yes. So for the older people here, it's Bombay. It's Bombay to me, too. Right, and then it became Mumbai. Yes. So my mom and my dad met... How they meet? at uh, my aunt's house, her older sister's house, because my dad was scoutmaster to my aunt's kids, my cousins. So dad wanted to be um, a fighter pilot, but he was the only son. So his parents were, my grandparents, were opposed to this idea because it was wartime. And so he decided that he would study medicine instead. Now, what did his father do? He was a businessman. He traded in wool. He traded in wool, and he also liked cricket, right? Actually, he was captain of India's field hockey team at one point. That's what you had told yeah. me, right. So that was Grandpa. That was okay. Grandpa. And gra the parents didn't want him to go in the military to be a fighter pilot. So they wanted him to be a businessman, like Grandpa, but he wanted to do his own thing. And... He was a big fan of the Perry Mason books. And before the start of each book, there was a dedication to a renowned jurist. And he became interested in forensic medicine through reading those dedications by Earl Stanley Gardner in the Perry Mason books. And forensic pathology wasn't a um, well-established field in India at the time. We're talking 70s, early 70s. And they didn't have the show Quincy, which was a forensic pathologist. Yeah, we used to watch that on videotape many, many years later. So he decided to become a forensic pathologist, and that's what he was until my sisters were born. The twins. The twins. And then he joined Glaxo to head up Glaxo's medical education department. Now, at Glaxo, he was working with the medical schools, right? So he worked to build, uh, to make audiovisual teaching aids in various different topics, subjects in medicine, and disseminated these aids worldwide, actually, even to the WHO. And he continued to teach uh, forensic medicine and forensic pathology in an honorary capacity at medical schools in Bombay. So tell me about mom and your, the twins and your brother. And we want everybody to be represented well. So my mom was a clinical psychologist until my sisters were born when she decided to, that she wanted to stay home with the kids. So I have a younger brother. He's three years younger than I am. He's the lawyer. He's the lawyer, works in the entertainment and media industry. And my younger sisters are identical twins, and they're three years after my brother. And they are both now directors of HR. Right, we have that picture of mom and dad the twins and your brother. And me, yeah. So tell me about growing up in India. After the war, After the division has taken place between Pakistan and India. I was born in 72. My parents are from two different backgrounds. And we lived in a cooperative housing society that was founded for the children of those people who came over during partition. So they were all Sindhis. So we were an unusual family in this society. Um, so we grew up very nuclear. And What do you mean nuclear? Um, because we're hybrids. Okay. <laughs> so Mutations? If you will. Okay. <laughs> 
and um, we felt a part of and yet a little yes, separate. Right. Um, so we ended up being really close to one another, uh, and, and I mean nuclear that way. We spent a lot of time together as siblings and with friends of my parents who were from all backgrounds and all walks of life. So our growing up was educational because we met so many interesting people through what my parents did. Because your parents, you know, one's a clinical psychologist, one is a forensic pathologist, okay, following, as we would say, in the Indian philosophy of professionalism, which was there. But you liked puzzles, you told me as a kid. So we would discuss cases and watch detective shows and read, I, I read detective stories growing up. And that's where I realized that I really liked the, the mystery aspect of this. But I didn't want to be a doctor because my dad was a doctor and was famous and I wanted to be my own person. So I decided I wanted to study uh, life sciences and biochemistry and be a researcher. And that wasn't a normal thing to do at that time either. It wasn't uh, mainstream. So I took a couple of years off after college. Let's talk about college first. Would you go to college? I went to St. Xavier's College in Bombay, where I studied life sciences and biochemistry. And what did you do be between the, the years before you went back to school? I studied German, and I volunteered in a research institute in Bombay, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Because I wanted to be a researcher, but I wanted to know what being a researcher meant. What was it like to work in a lab? But a lot of people who get into research or researcher, they have a, a, a f family history or something. They say, my relative died of cancer, my some, somebody had heart disease or some type of other thing. You didn't have that situation. You just wanted to do this because you cared about research. Yes. Now you go back to school after the Tata. After the Tata, while well, I'm studying German, uh, teaching German and working in the lab, I realized that, yes, I, I know what uh, it's like being in a research lab. I really enjoy it. I like the kinds of people who are researchers. So I go to Pune University to get my master's degree in uh, biotechnology. And that's where I met my husband. So my husband was in the physics department. I was in the biotechnology department. And the cafeteria was midway between the two. So I met him there, and we, had, we ended up having lots of friends in common. Now, growing up, did you ever come to America? No, I never did. My aunt was here, and she would visit, but I never visited. Coming to the U.S. was my second time on a plane. So how did you come to the U.S.? So I came to graduate school at Duke in 1997. And you did that because your husband was going to Duke? He was going to stay behind, actually. So he was already in a PhD program, and I wanted to study biochemistry and molecular biophysics. So I applied to several graduate schools and ended up going to Duke because there was some really interesting professors there, particularly one who... How was the change from India to Duke? I mean, it's a totally different type of world, a different environment. Research-wise, it was, it was amazing. It opened up my world in a way that I could never have imagined. Culturally, Durham is a small town. Bombay is a crazier version of New York. So it was two different kinds of adjustments that I had to make getting used to uh, the pace of life in a place like Durham, North Carolina, after growing up in a place like Bombay. But that's when I got interested in blues music because of the time I spent in North Carolina. So you get your master's at, at Duke, and then how do you de decide to come to the Big Apple? I'm at Duke. My husband has followed me to Duke. And then we graduate and we're looking for postdoctoral positions together. 
Um, and he ended up going to mechanical engineering at MIT, and I ended up going to molecular and cellular biology at Harvard. And the lab I was in, uh, Tom Maniotis's lab, decided to move from Harvard to Columbia while I was in my uh, second or third year of my postdoc. So we decided to move with him. And my, I moved to Columbia, and my husband moved to the Courant Institute at NYU. So you're at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Do you go to Tom? Tell me a little bit about Tom. Because Tom is like the head researcher at the Genome Center, correct? So Tom is now scientific director at the New York Genome Center. When we moved uh, from Harvard to Columbia, he moved to be the chairman of the Department of Biochemistry at Columbia. And he was one of the people instrumental in the founding of the New York Genome Center. So for my audience, tell me about the New York Genome Center. It's, it's a hidden gem that people aren't aware of. It's a one-of-a-kind nonprofit research institution that aims to apply, to, to marry technology with medicine and use genomics technologies to transform our understanding of diseases like uh, ALS, Alzheimer's, different types of cancer, psychiatric diseases like schizophrenia or illnesses like autism. So how do you get involved? So Tom is now at Columbia. So Tom is at Columbia. They're talking about founding a place called the New York Genome Center that's going to be a place for every academic institution in and around New York, meant to be a resource, a hub for the community, and it sounds spectacular. But I didn't think I would ever have a place there because it sounded so amazing, and I didn't think that I had the right skill sets. I was interested in mechanism, in neurodegenerative disease. I didn't really do much genomics beyond expression analyses. But the opportunity arose. Uh, they were hiring faculty. I applied and interviewed, and I got the job. Let's talk about the job and the specific project, because people have heard about ALS, but people don't understand the condition, and they don't understand that you really can't test for it. And let's talk about that. I mean, the, people came to ALS from Lou Gehrig, the day in the movie, the Gary Cooper movie of saying, the you know, pride of the, Yankees. the pride of the Yankees, okay? That's what people heard. And then it really passed on that it was quiet. It was a quiet disease because there's X amount, what, 5,000? How many people each year are diagnosed? About 6,000. 6,000 6, people. So it's not really a, a heavily known disease. But then there was something that you've been involved with, with the Ice Bucket Campaign and the Toe Foundation and some other programs. But let's talk about the condition and what you do and what you do with the New York Genome Center on this condition. So we wanted to apply genomics to understand the causes and mechanisms underlying ALS. For the novice, explain genomics. It's how our genes and how the genes are expressed how the combination of those things makes the body work or causes dysfunction and illness. So we're trying to apply new technologies to figure this out and how this might apply to diseases like ALS, frontotemporal dementia, Alzheimer's. Now, when we're talking about understanding new mutations that are associated with ALS, we want to sequence a patient's entire genome, all the genes in that patient, do this for thousands of patients, compare this sequence to... Do we do, we do it with live patients or do we do it with both live and dead patients? Some things we do with live patients. Some studies are only possible with tissues donated by people who have died of the disease. We, we do a combination of both. When you're doing, uh, when you're comparing gene sequences in patients versus normal healthy people, you need thousands and thousands of sequences to be able to compare, and thousands and thousands of people. Now, ALS is a rare disease, which means that to get thousands and thousands of patients 
you, right, especially with only five to six thousand cases each year. Right. So, and that's around the world. In the U.S. In the U.S. Okay. So in the U.S., there may be between twenty-five and thirty-five thousand people with the disease. And if you need five to ten thousand genomes to sequence, you're not going to get them from just one clinic. You need to be able to pool resources from multiple clinics. Now, ALS is complicated because it can present differently in different individuals. So you've got two challenges up front. It's different in different people, and it's rare. So you need to combine. Is there a specific age that normally it comes out? Because I saw a, a YouTube video about a 37-year-old, and then there are different age, more, more times it's over 50, right? Most of the time, the median age is uh, mid-50s, but there are cases where it can set in much earlier than that. We people in their 30s, sometimes even younger, and people who are older as well. So we're trying to understand that, right? Are there particular mutations that cause it to set in early? Are there particular mutations that affect the rate at which it progresses? So in order to be able to do this, you need to be able to compare all this information from multiple different clinics. So the program that we started at the G Genome Center allows us to pool all of the data from multiple clinics, combine the resources of so many different sites, not just over the United States, but also internationally. And all of these people come together to combine the samples and the clinical information and to come up with new ways of analyzing the data that we collect. So we've been responsible for the identification of several new ALS-associated genes as a result of these efforts through this consortium. And we're also developing new ways to examine samples that people donate once they die, to look at the brains and the spinal cords of these people. And what we're trying to do there is understand what the local environment is around the nerve cells that are going to die in this disease. Because just like in Manhattan, the neighborhood matters a lot in neurodegenerative diseases. Why does Alzheimer's present as Alzheimer's? Why does frontotemporal dementia present the way it does? But it sounds like all three of those diseases have similarities in them. They have similarities and differences. And we're trying to understand what the similarities and differences might be. Because the, in Alzheimer's disease, you see more of a degenerative on the mind. Right. Okay. The person loses their, their ability to speak. They lose their ability. While on ALS, it's more of a muscular situation. Well, ALS is part of a clinical spectrum that also includes frontotemporal dementia. So the same genes that cause ALS can cause frontotemporal dementia in another member of the family or in a different patient. So we're trying to understand how these mutations affect the function of the nerve cell that's going to be vulnerable and how the other cells that are not neurons that surround these nerve cells, how they help to support the nerve cells' health and function and how this gets disrupted in disease. Now, are the pharmaceutical companies behind this right now to the, try to save? There are. There's intense uh, efforts underway to come up with new ways of uh, finding mechanisms where you can intervene, of finding new biomarkers so you can track the disease better, so you can see if new therapeutic approaches are actually having the impact that you need. How, how does one diagnose that someone is coming down with ALS? So diagnosis is difficult too and can be a long and painful journey. And that's because we don't have a simple blood test that you can do in the clinic. So usually it's a process of elimination. And sometimes it can take several months, even up to a year or, to get Or, you diagnosed. know, as I was saying when I did on my other show, the Alzheimer's show, we spoke about a PET scan today can provide ins insight for Alzheimer's. Can a PET scan provide insight? Not yet, but people are actively working on. Recently you've been involved with a new study, I think, with the Toe Foundation. 
So the program at the New York Genome Center, the Center for Genomics of Neurodegenerative Disease, was established because of contributions from the ALS Association and the Tau Foundation. Now, how did the idea of the ice bucket come out? How was that? So that wasn't us. That was... Um, the ALS Association. That was a patient with ALS uh, who came up with the idea, and then it went viral. And then the ALS Association, uh, it, it raised a lot of money for the ALS Association. And this was one of the first four programs that was funded as a result of the ice bucket challenge money and has transformed the field of ALS genomics. So where, did, where is the ALS genomics in five years? What, what's the hope of the Geno Center in doing this? We hope that we will have identified several new genes that when mutated can cause ALS and FTD. We hope that we will understand why these mutations are causing the disease, what, what processes in, in the nerve cell or the neighbors of the nerve cells are being disrupted. We hope to have a better understanding of that um, and perhaps commonalities and differences between diseases like ALS, FTD, and Alzheimer's. Now, how many people are working on this program at the Geno Center? How many researchers? Well, so my group is about 15 people, and it's split between the New York Genome Center and Columbia. But there are several additional people, even outside of the group, who contribute to the work that's done there. So there's computational biologists and software engineers and project managers. And as a result of these efforts at NYGC, several new researchers in the New York area have become interested in studying the disease. Several new researchers worldwide have become um, involved in the studies that we do. And this is a worldwide study right now. This said. is a worldwide study right now. Now, internationally, where are the places of major interest of work? The University of Edinburgh is one, University College London is one, the uh, Weizmann Institute in Israel is one. Uh, we were involved with a project led by the Technion where we're going to sequence the whole genomes of every ALS patient in Israel as a part of these efforts. Greece is donating samples. We have partners in is the Is there any uh, her hereditary? About 15 to 20 percent of ALS is hereditary, runs in families. The rest of it, about 85 percent, is sporadic in origin, no known family history. So tell me about what your husband's doing here today, these days. My husband? Right. My husband was trained as a physicist and now teaches math at New York University. Not at the Tata. Institute. No longer at the Tata Institute. No, but I mean Tata is at Roosevelt Island with the Technion and Cornell, so it's an interesting. So it's interesting that the Perry Mason lady, okay, who used to read all the Perry Mason and the other, you know, the Quincy, quietly followed in her father's footsteps, okay? Not a pathologist, but a researcher. And the good part is that the world has people like you and the Geno Center working on this terrible disease. And one day there'll be some, hopefully there'll be some research to take care of the disease, medication to ease the pain and suffering. And thanks for being here today. Thank you very much, Michael, for having me.